Hey, hi everyone. Welcome to VCTV, the Venture Capital TV. Um, as, you, as you can see, uh, it's the Venture Capital TV from La Chogan. Uh, so welcome uh, speakers. Well, I have three speakers today, three new speakers uh, and Gary as well. Gary is here, three new speakers uh, who are gonna talk about education tech, e-learning and online school. Isn't that interesting? So before we deep dive into the speakers and the topic, which is very close to my heart, considering it's about education and the future of education, because, because education is the future of the country. So, uh, so um, before we deep dive into that, I just want to like to introduce myself. My name is Sunny Mohanty. I'm the regional director of um, Law Token, a Law Token host VCTV, which is the venture capital TV platform where we connect people for networking, for collaborations, for connection, for funding, and whatnot. And basically a bit about the history of VCTV. VCTV was born in March 2020. Actually, I'm wrong. February 2020, very, very, very fast after the pandemic hit the economy. So we switched our roadshows, our offline roadshows, where the idea, the goal was the same, to connect investors, with, uh, to con uh, with the founders uh, to match, make, help and grow, funding, collaboration. Uh, so we, 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 we had to uh, very fast move into an online platform because of the pandemic. Um, but since then it has grown in terms of community, in terms of viewerships, uh, in terms of investor community, speakers, founders, whatnot. And I've been hosting uh, since March, 2020 uh, because of, uh, you know, uh, just once in a uh, once in I started off once in a once in a week, but now I host it every day, Monday to Friday, 8 p.m. Singapore, very fixed. Um, so we have more than one shows as well uh, in Asia. We have uh, two shows in a uh, in a day, also U.S. as well as you all 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 know. So welcome to VCTV all over again. Uh, today's is uh, today's panel is a very interesting topic, and I have two new speakers, and I would like to introduce uh, introduce them first. Uh, Satik from Singapore. Hi, Satik. Hi. Satik Sat Taj. Sorry, I know that you told me your, how to pronounce your first name. My apologies. That's fine. No problem. Sataj, uh, from Singapore. Uh, please uh, introduce uh, you what you do in the company, a bit about your company uh, and your experience in the space. Thank you. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm um, based in Singapore. I'm actually originally from Turkey, Istanbul, but I spent most of my adult life in Italy. So, you know, I've been around the, the world for, for, for quite, quite a few years. And what do I do? I am I'm a fund manager, uh, ad advisor. Uh, I uh, work with impact investing um, ecosystem. Uh, I build systems, uh, sometimes ecosystems in different countries. So I, I'm, I'm very much active in all aspects of in fund management and investments. And, um, and education has a um, big role in my life, partly because I have, uh, you know, two young daughters who actually are studying. So education is part of our life. And, um, and I also have been very active as an investor in the education world, as an, uh, I, I'm in the advisory board of a number of business schools. So it, it, it's a theme that I've I been very much familiar with over the years, and it's a pleasure being here. Thank you very much for inviting me. I, I know you rightly said, uh, Sabej, like you with your kids and obviously everybody goes to school and education is a part of your life on every day's life. Thank you so much for those introductory words, really appreciate it. Next, I have another speaker who's joined VCTV even for the first time. He's so excited uh, the, the, because he's told me a number of times before we went live how excited he is to be on VCTV today. Chandra Shekhar from uh, Chennai, India. Thank you very much, Sunny, for having me here. It's such a uh, you know, great happiness, privilege to be part of this amazing uh, panel. I mean, Gary is someone you know, whom I've heard a lot and you know, such a great you know, uh, inspiration you are, Gary. And with Sartaj, you know, I had an opportunity to speak uh, you know, just before the session. Uh, what, what an amazing profile. And 
Hirsch is someone whom I have known, you know, via my LinkedIn connect. So, you know, again, amazing, uh, you know, sort of a team out here. So once again, thank you for having me, you know, here. Quickly about my background. My basic qualification is in finance and accounting. So I'm a chartered accountant with multiple other professional qualifications, both in finance and management areas. I started my career with Exxon Mobil. From there, I moved to KPMG. And my last stint uh, as an employee was with a UK-based multinational called Lone Meat Group. And this group had brands such as Yardley of London, Finnis, and other well-known brands, which are quite popular in respective geographies. Now, I had phenomenal experience and exposure with this group because I met a lot of iBankers, venture capital funds, private equity guys, hedge funds, and a lot of you know, law firms too. So it gave me you know, tremendous experience in terms of how do you do a transaction, structure a transaction, conclude a transaction. I did almost 11 acquisitions and four divestments. And the last transaction I did was selling the group to Lee and Fung, which is a billion dollar Hong Kong based group. Now, this is the interesting part. Uh, the entrepreneurial bug you know, bit me as early as 2011. And uh, when this transaction was happening, I was actually super glad because you know, I was chancing my you know, ways by which I could become an entrepreneur. And once the transaction happened, I started a business called Anova, which began you know, uh, in June, 2013. So it's been more than seven years. Quickly on ANOVA, ANOVA is an advisory firm and our focus is on m and buy side or sell side as the case may be. And we are also into fundraise. So we work with a lot of early stage companies, growth stage companies in terms of their fundraise, not just from VCs, but sometimes even from the corporate world, the strategic investors. We are sector agnostic and have completed assignments across various segments, just to name few, manufacturing, FMCG, luxury goods, healthcare, hospitality, and one can never forget the technology-led, technology-enabled businesses. So those are some of the things that we have done. Now, in the last 24 months, I also became an angel investor. And I've, I've invested now close to 20 startups. I'm also part of a couple of angel funds. And my investments currently are across segments, of course, includes edtech. Uh, it also includes health tech, fintech, food and beverages, FMCG, consumer tech. I've also invested in clean tech, regulatory tech, gaming, and I've not left even footwear. So you know, those are you know, some of my angel investments. <laughs> I'm so, so happy to be here. As I said, no, it's a great happiness to have such an amazing panel. So thank you once again. Chandrasekhar, I've lost words now. Like, you know, what should I say? With the kind of diverse and wide range of experience and, and in, uh, you know, kind of uh, investment experience that you have, it's very much needed for our shows and also for the founders and entrepreneurs entrepreneurs that we have, the kind of experience you have, and you're going to share the insights on this panel. And again, welcome to VCTV. I'm very grateful to have you on this panel today. Thank, Thank you. you. And so I'm equally learn too, you know, from all of you. So, so I'm, I'm equally grateful. Thank you. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, next, I have Harsh again, who is uh, joined us for the very first time on VCTV. Hi, Harsh. Welcome to VCTV. How are you today? Hi, I'm quite well. Thank you so much for asking. Uh, it's a great opportunity here. I'm gl so glad to be here on this platform today. <clears throat> so, Harsh, uh, we are taking introductions. Yes, please go ahead. Sure. So, yeah, coming to that, uh, I think Chandrasekhar has already covered a lot of ground and the profile he's come up is quite impressive. Uh, I'll keep it short. Uh, I'm basically a serial entrepreneur myself. Uh, before I uh, started with the entrepreneur uh, journey myself, I was <clears throat> into the media and advertising industry. Uh, I've worked with brands like Cadbury's, uh, 20th Century Fox, uh, Access Bank. So I was basically handling the media strategy for these brands. Uh, I did that for about eight years, uh, moved to my hometown, started my first startup, which was into a food delivery based uh, kitchen. We were like a cloud kitchen, but a very small space in Nasik. Uh, we, we, had, we had four kitchens across Nasik and we would uh, have a just-in-time inventory kind of a ordering where uh, you know, the, the, our customers order one in advance and we will make as per order. Uh, from there, I started my second startup, which was into education space. We made a platform, uh, a space for communicate, uh, education, communication for schools, students, parents, and principals. That was the platform we worked on. Uh, I started with two schools, uh, uh, about 3,000 uh, parents. And by the end of it, we were across 48 schools. Uh, we got acquired in 2000, uh, early 2019, around Jan 2019, we got acquired. Uh, and since then, uh, I've been uh, actively participating into IB profile investment banking, uh, helping a couple of, uh, started with helping a couple of friends raise funds. And that's how my IB profile started. Uh, I joined AHA 
uh, about uh, in December last year, uh, where I started with the uh, you know function of uh, venture partner, where I was taking care of Maharashtra and Nasi to be very specific. Uh, my expertise obviously being from the tech space as well as IoT and AI. So any startup which usually comes to Aha, I am actively involved in evaluating those startups so that we put them through, and if it, it goes through, then uh, investors also benefit from the curation we have done. Uh, I'm also uh, equally, uh, you know, interested and excited about incubation accelerators. I'm I'm participating uh, quite quite extensively with uh, three incubators. One is based out of Singapore, uh, one is based out of Pune, and one is based out of uh, uh, Mumbai. So uh, <laughs> the startup journey is, I mean, I, because I've seen both the sides of the table. Uh, that's why the the journey is something which I spend a lot of time with the founders, understanding how they've come. They're a long way of, uh, you know, from starting with an idea to raising funds. And that's, I think, where I'm adding a lot of value. Uh, I'm working with 16 startups right now. Uh, most of them uh, are in India, but about six uh, are, are based on Singapore, US and UK. So that's from my side. Thank you so much. Oh, fantastic, Hush. Really, really diverse, again, uh, a variety of experience. And uh, well, I, I really love to have people with, I mean, I love everybody, everyone on my panel, but you know, you are you you are new uh, first time uh, on VCTV and uh, you are deep dive in education. You started off with education, schools and everything. So it's just like, you know, very good to know. I was having a discussion with Chandrasekhar well, in India, so many schools, so many education center. I know for a fact, you know, so many schools, so many tuition classes, now, you know, springing up every now and then. Education is a big, big part of our lives in India. I know that for a fact. <laughs> so that's why this topic is very close to my heart, as I always say. And all as parents, everybody, and you know, education is a part of our life. Um, thank you so much, uh, uh, Hash, as well for the introduction. And yes, I know about the Singapore uh, um, form that you're talking about. Right, thank you so right. Much. All world. <laughs> Um, last but not least, uh, last but not least, Gary. Hi, Gary. Welcome back on VCTV. How are you Hello, doing, how, by the way? I'm good. How are you? I am great as usual. <laughs> good to see you today. So, um, anyhow, it's great to be here. I'm I'm just a country boy from Pennsylvania, so it's great to be here with all these uh, amazing people. So, anyhow, my name is Gary Fowler, serial entrepreneur. I've done 16 companies. I've been involved in two unicorns. I was on the original management team at Click Software, which was sold to Salesforce for $1.35 billion, and also Eva.ai, which is a company I started four and a half years ago with a billionaire, David Yang, out of Silicon Valley. I love artificial intelligence. I've written 107 articles now. So I went over my goal for the year was 100 for one year. I have two books coming out on AI, uh, love artificial intelligence. Uh, I go around the world seeking the best AI companies from Africa, from India, Russia, wherever, US. And what we do is we curate them. We believe there are really three stages of a startup. One is they go through acceleration to get the product market fit and MVP. Two is it's uh, really they get regional dominance, wherever that is, India, Russia, Europe. But then what do you do next? Stage three is hard, especially during the pandemic. And I started two of the top accelerators, so GBA it's, uh, and also Skokova Startup Academy. But what we find is at the third stage, it's really hard. How do you get out there to create a unicorn? Everybody talks about it, right? Unicorn, unicorn, unicorn. But what is the third step? The third step is a lot about connections in Silicon Valley. It's a lot about trust. And it's lots about operational expertise. So what we said is, what if we take some of the best people in the world and basically bone them on to these uh, startups that can really dominate their space and take them out to the rest of the world. So we're Silicon Valley based. We're in Santa Clara, California, and also in Palo Alto. And our goal is to be able to take those companies, <coughs> shape them like a, an amazing piece of clay and make an incredible uh, Rodin sculpture out of them essentially. So, you know, Ooh. put that final touch on them. And uh, we've been pretty successful doing it and we love it. So if, you, if there are startups out there from anywhere, any place that have something and they really are, have the right spirit, the right time and the right team, we, that's what we do. We help them go out. So thank Fantastic, you. Gary. I'm an investor too. So I'm involved yes. in a hundred million dollar fund and uh, we have our private money in a fund. And also I started a $10 million seed fund that's uh, 
several of them are fully deployed, but we, we love uh, investing also. Yes, Gary, just to add on to Country Boy thing, I mean, everybody's a fan of yours, by the way, everybody. I, I, I appreciate it. I'm not worthy, though. I'm just a country boy, for real. <laughs> so, But it's great to be here. I love it. It's great to see you, Sonny, and Carol's here somewhere. So it's great to see all the, uh, the uh, new folks, too. So Harsh, so Tak, so Dushkar, it's great. You pronounced it very nicely, actually. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. So, uh, yeah, we all set with the introductions of our speakers uh, for the panel today. I'm really excited, um, as usual, and this today's topic is very much, uh, again, very close to my heart. I would like to start with Sattaj, um, uh, who has just joined us, for, joined us for the first time. Uh, take us through what happened in 2020 um, if, in the space, especially uh, you live in Singapore, and I don't think Singapore... Uh, I don't know about the private, I think, yeah, sorry, I know about the private schools as well. None of the schools were um, in uh, lockdown as much as India. I guess India, all the schools are still, I think, closed, shut down. But in Singapore, all the schools are open, um, if you're talking about Singapore. But globally, generally, I think everybody sort of went online for education. So um, yeah. let's start with Tataj over to you uh, with your opening remarks. For the topic. Well, I, I think we just have to look at the sort of education sector as a whole to, to sort of comment on it. Now, education is one of those sectors that for many years was actually quite immune to um, disruption, um, partly because it was actually riding on a very high wave of increasing population, especially in the developing parts of the world and mostly in Asia and elsewhere, um, with um, incredible demand for education. And most the educational institutions relied heavily on uh, beefing up their facilities and their physical facilities and, and, and trying to invest as much as money into brick and mortar for many years. And that system, uh, not only in terms of, um, you know, big expense expenditures around uh, building a facilities, but it relied heavily on faculty administration, a lot of other perks around, uh, you know, how to, especially private schools, how to attract students uh, based on services that they created. Yeah. This inflated the whole sector um, um, into a very high cost and low efficiency spiral for many years. And this is true uh, for almost any part of the world. Um, and then there was actually relatively little money in the public schools um, and public schools in most cases could not compete with uh, in terms of facilities with the, the private institutions. And then over the last four years, we've seen a lot of ventures coming into the market, uh, especially partly on the higher education part, trying to give online and scalable, uh, um, you know, uh, far reaching solutions, you know, the Coursera's, the edX's yeah, of, that's correct. of the world. Uh, and this was increasing. But you, it did not trickle down. Um, um, a, a lot of the universities were caught off guard by the pandemic because they uh, had to, in a very uh, almost um, makeshift fashion, uh, switch from uh, a typical, you know, um, education based on brick and mortar and proximity to to faculty. Uh, classroom education into digital education. And that shift, I think, uh, you know, I'm sure that they learned a lot and, and there's no way going back. I think we're going to see a lot of hybrid education coming into force in the next uh, five to 10 years and becoming sort of a, a point of reference. But it, it actually showed the vulnerabilities of these higher education institutions because they were still asking for a very hefty price, but students were basically sitting uh, uh -huh. uh, using Zoom as we're using right now and, yeah. and not really getting the service or the type of education that they are paid, they were paying for. 
and this is yes. across the border happening all, everywhere. When you go out into the, um, you know, the, the high schools and even the K-12 institutions, pretty much same thing happened, um, except that, you know, it depended on where you were and what type of uh, income bracket you were in, what type of school they were in, and, and forcing students out into uh, remote education whereby infrastructure was not present in most cases, created inequalities, uh, unbelievable equalities. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an impact investor and I work for Purpose Venture Capital. So, uh, you know, it's a very important aspect, you know, how does technology create inequality and how are you addressing it? And one of the biggest inequalities that we've created over the last seven, eight months is that those who had access to Wi-Fi, had access to, had a decent home where they could study after actually by themselves in front of a computer would benefit from um, digital education. But those who did not have access to any of the technologies that would give them a chance to do remote learning or sit in cramped houses with little uh, possibility, yes, they suffered a lot. And we're going to see that trend. I've seen the numbers, for example, those who are missing out on um, you know, access to education over the course of their lifetime are going to because of these phenomena over the over the last year and i think we're yeah. going to well into next Sorry. year they, they'll be they'll be i think missing out six to seven percent of income um over the course of their lifetime so there's a huge inequality that's happening and that needs to be addressed so i'm just going to finish here so sonny if anybody wants to intervene um, do you, do you, um... yeah, uh, sorry, Sata, I just want to say, because I was losing you from in between. So I was just wondering everything. I mean, it's not me. <laughs> so no, I, I see you fine. So actually I was about to ask you a very good, uh, a question on a very good point, but impact investments, because you invest, uh, as you rightly said, on, uh, on, uh, elaborating and extending on that particular topic, uh, because we know Singapore, we, we are all well, I mean, you know, generally population is. Has, has access to 100% education, be it private schools or public schools. Um, um, what about which, which countries do you actually focus on in terms of impact investments in education? Well, uh, right now, uh, in terms of impact investing, you know, for, for, for a while, I was uh, managing a fund that invested in India, Pakistan, in, in Myanmar, and in Cambodia. And I also have been quite active in Turkey and in the Middle East. Um, and right now I'm evaluating a number of different uh, education uh, um, related uh, investments in Malaysia and in, in, in the Philippines. So, you know, I've sort of seen it across the border in different countries. The impact investing, what is impact investing for those of you who don't know what it is? It's basically um, uh, is balancing financial gain with social and yeah. environmental Okay. Again, and, and making sure that uh, these three pillars actually happen uh, at the same time. Uh, and, um, and education is, is, is a very big aspect of it because actually uh, you can generate income, but you're also doing a social good. Uh, so you have to be very mindful of how that social good is, uh, in a way, um, is defined and measured. Um, and this is this is very important. Um, right. So this is, I think, um, my view that, as I said, you know, education is very important, a big pillar. Absolutely. But you have to create the conditions for it to be equitable. Absolutely, it should it should be accessible to everyone. Education. Thank you so much, uh, Sataj, for those uh, opening remarks. Really powerful and impactful as well. Uh, next, I have to understand. Chandra Shekhar, and uh, please uh, help uh, with the opening remarks uh, for the topic sure, sure. because you are deep dive, deep dive, uh, deep down into education sector. So, so it is true, you know that uh, you know lockdown has been there on the schools, on the colleges for a long, long time. It's there even now, on a test basis. You know, some of the schools, especially the classes from ninth to twelfth, they have tried to open in some of the states. Colleges are still closed. I come from. Uh, Chennai, where we have IIT Madras, they tried an opening up, you know, but still, you know, there are some cases, uh, you know, that were there. So 
it's still a lockdown situation, but that's about the lockdown. Now we are speaking about egg tech, and I think when it comes to India, it's the flavor of the season, right? I yeah. mean, so much of noise and voice, you know, egg tech is making. It's like the golden era. Yeah. I mean, whenever we speak about egg tech, you know, we are all, <laughs> you know, pleasantly, you know, uh, taken for a huge surprise. But I'll borrow what uh, Sartan said. I think uh, education, uh, in particular. and probably you know of you know out of the education i think edtech is kind of immune to such situations that we are facing so mm-hmm. it has always been big i think edtech yeah. has always been big probably you know pandemic has made it noisier probably <laughs> we are hearing a lot you know because yeah. of the pandemic you know pandemic, so yeah. uh, whenever you know we discuss you know with our clients or let's say some of the other businesses you know we use this mantra saying you know survive revive thrive yeah. but when it comes to edtech you know it's unbelievable it survive revive and then prosper because that's what is happening you know i mean the businesses here are prospering big time in fact you know uh, the edtech companies no more believe in survival of the fittest they say it's a survival of the fastest so who are you know is sort of you know able to clinch out there i yeah. mean you know you get the highest reward and i was just wondering why is the case so just before the session i did discuss with you i think there is this fomo with the parents the fear of yeah. missing out because uh, when it comes to india parents in india they are willing to spend disproportionate amount for the betterment of the children i mean take me absolutely. as a parent you have to do that okay absolutely i'm sure some of you know some of the panel members would agree with me but i also will tell you what is interesting about edtech i think edtech is all about customers customer what i mean right. by that is there is a user but there is also a customer so the user could be the children you know could be you know the yeah. one you know who is actually using it but who is funding it it's the parent Yeah. So I think you have to ensure that you know both the UX, the user experience, and the CX, the customer experience. You know that has to be kept in mind, and I think that's what has successfully happened with you know some of the edtech companies. Because I've always told myself when it comes to any sort of a learning, it's an experience. Everything else is information. So yeah. I think you know if yeah. the experience is great, if it is very very experiential, I think that's where you know we all stand out. And no wonder you know in 2020, I mean the investments were you know north of two billion dollars. You know which the edtech companies got. i mean close to 100 uh, you know startups they got almost close to 2 billion dollar if you compare with last year it was only 500 million so i think that's that's you know a, a bonanza that's like a windfall that's happening out here and i think it's happening you know because of the fact that uh, number one the universities the colleges the schools they're quite nimble and agile they were able to embrace the technology much more faster and probably even the edtech companies you know were able to seamlessly you know sort of ensure that you know the services were offered in a way that it was not hitting too much you know on their cost or mm. probably even in terms of ensuring you know that you know it was it was given in you know for the purpose that the institution you know wanted so i think that is something you know that is very interesting about india and i've always felt you know that that is one of the reason why edtech companies are doing so well because they understand the customer well at the same time you know they also understand you know, what is required for the market I'm going to stop yes. there so that no others can pitch in. Yeah. No, Chandrasekhar, Chandrasekhar, very good the point that you highlighted. Uh, one one point I really want to say that you, we have the users, which is the children, and then you have the sponsors, who are the parents. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's a yeah. I mean, impact is twice over there, and True. also knowledge. I mean, education is just knowledge without with without an experience is just knowledge. Absolutely. Very rightly said. <laughs> great great uh, highlights there um chandrashekhar might might say uh, my apologies again for stumbling on your name sorry about that oh, no worries no worries uh, <laughs> <laughs> next i have harsh harsh um let's start with you with your uh, with your opening remarks please uh well i think chandrashekhar was quite bang on uh, with uh, the whole scenario of how indian startup ecosystem in education has really transformed Uh, so back then, then in 2014, when actually uh, you know when I started my first startup or even the ecosystem was developing, startup by itself was uh, comparatively a new concept because we just had uh, you know big names like Flipkart coming in 2009, and then eventually it built up. But if you observe uh, Asia as a market, <clears throat> the DNA of startups lies lies in how you solve the problem locally. You know so. while we have uber for the world we still have ola in india right so that does great numbers so the dna of startups in asian countries is tremendously uh, dynamic so how you look at solving that issue during that time gets maximum mileage so you know as you are all aware uh, you know we had a big transition in terms of currency demonetization so during that time you know fintech really went off the roof because uh, there were people who never used 
indirect started making indirect transactions so that's the push we which we were forced to do but uh, i think uh, india as a population transitioned quite well so like i said yeah. the the dna factor of not just startups but even people to adjust to new uh, normal is is quite uh, you know part of our lives so that you know you easily pick up pick up some things or forced to pick up some things yeah uh, coming to why i think uh, this pandemic has been uh, you know just as what demonetization was for fintech uh, it just went off the roof right so in it, because the opportunity grew to that level where people just were forced to change their models i worked with around 200 government schools uh, while the government would support uh, you know in millions of dollars financially uh, i had seen uh, majority of the col- uh, schools in rural india where they were given fiber optic internet but they didn't know you they didn't know how to use internet so the rat was eating the fiber optic uh, you know wires that wow. level of that's just but from there i've seen technology being used maximize so i uh, recently i went last month to one of the very very uh, rural uh, parts of uh, maharashtra to the extent the, there is no road to reach that school but they are geofenced they have classes taking from delhi their exams are on whatsapp and the evaluation has mm-hmm. on zoom so that's the transition <laughs> yes. so uh, you know i was mind boggled i was wondering how this happened that the execution was something phenomenal <laughs> so i went back and i started speaking to my mentors uh, you know a couple of them i'm sure you guys know so one was uh, uh, from a very well known fintech one was from education uh, i started understanding how how were we forced to make this transition so uh, if you see technologically india has been uh, quite well or doing quite well but usage of technology penetration is still low uh, to give you perspective so they, they there's a this data which was available in the government uh, site so smartphones used uh, by rural households where the child goes into the government uh, school was only 29% before the pandemic hit us right post pandemic that 29% went to 57% so that tells you that the parents which uh, like chandrashekhar said he was the enablers the, the people who are going to provide yeah. that yes uh, are still of those guys who said doesn't make a difference if i can't afford a cell phone which is just 2000 rupees i don't care i need to do this for the education right so that that transition in having a, 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 a outlook towards education i think that's a bigger change so while we talk about zoom classrooms and everything if the enablers really believe uh, that using technology is going to change my child's future i think we have we have you know the edtech sector has really been very very successful i mean it's mind boggling harsh to hear what just you said like you know remote yeah. village of maharashtra whatsapp right. is used for education i mean yeah if you, so uh, in fact uh, you know coming to the next point so why i see this is happening everywhere uh, but if you look at uh, you know the the transaction the deals which have happened acro- around just in the crowded space you 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 talk about byju's white hat junior those guys are still talking to the category a or category b audience uh, but the education uh, sector if you see comes from rural india because that's where the majority of indian population is so why we actually the reason why we were there in that village because we were awarding one innovation now look at how simple the innovation was now this guy realized all the schools are shut no one is going to provide us with any kind of support but mm-hmm. students want to learn now yeah. every village in india particularly have this one big microphone set in the center of the village the village is microphone is about, yeah huge microphone so like speakers okay where they would put on news any announcement to the village now what this guy did is he had a smartphone and using a couple of wires he connected that smartphone with six villages and he started taking lectures on his microphone through his mobile so he would talk about geography one day he would talk about science the next day and children would just sit in every village under that one microphone one big speaker and understand what is he speaking wow. so that innovation needs to be supported more fund more or taken to yeah. so now if you look at business it's scalable right it, it can happen to every village in india yeah what does he require he requires some amount of funding for technology it does not really require that much so we wanted to support him in terms of you know in a, innovative idea government funds so he, he eventually did get funded but i'm saying that space is still neglected so that's yeah. where you know indian innovation is happening so that's by yeah. my opinion 
I mean, something that I learned you very much new in terms of education space, how innovative can India be, rural India, in Absolutely. terms of adopting technology and still reaching out to the rural masses, the children uh, in the villages when it comes yeah. to education. This is really, really uh, mind-boggling and uh, enlightening as well. I mean, for the audience as well who may not know about this. Thank you so much, Hush, uh, for the sharing those insights with us and of yours. Excellent. Yeah. Gary, over to you. Uh, I mean, we've talked, spoken about a lot of rural impact based investments into education. Let's hear it from you then. Yeah, I mean, the situation is look at where we are today, how the world has fundamentally changed. I mean, if you asked us a year ago uh, how many people would be online being educated around the world because of the pandemic, it would have been a very small number. But we've had to digitally shift education over that period of time and dramatically increase the depth and breadth of education. So, you know, where, you know, where are we today? So we've got the fun, you know, keep it simple, stupid. That's my thing. Uh, we've got kids online that need to be entertained. We've got to have more immersive experience for the educational process today. We also got to have things like cross learning, the capability to be able to collaborate and share. And at the same time, look at a teacher's role compared to what we were a year ago. So in many parts of the world, the teachers doesn't see the student other than online, right? And they've got to manage a classroom online. So imagine the kind of tools and the way they have to think, as Steve Jobs said, think differently. So, you know, the re revolution and this explosion has finally taken place. And it's given us a chance to do things in a much different way and also to spread out who can be educated. Think about the opportunities. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter who you are. It matters only that you have access to technology, which is another issue that we need to address because it's gotta be fair across the board. But I believe that's changing too. So um, we're up on it. I'm looking at, you know, if you look at what's happening today, a lot of it's happening across multiple vertical markets. So in terms of education, hyper-personalization, being able to have personalized programs, well, hyper-personalization goes across multiple verticals too. It's the same thing in e-commerce. What are we looking at? How to make it better? How can we buy things better? How can we educate better? Artificial intelligence. Think about being able to do multiple choice tests. Let's keep it simple. Have an artificial intelligence that already, already does the grading for you and then can adjust curriculums based on that particular student and where they are in the learning process. We didn't have that a couple of years ago. We do have those kind of things taking place now. So it's an exciting uh, time. I'm looking, so for me, think about the immersive experience too, using AR and VR. Yeah. Sonny, we can, we can travel, any kid right now that's online can travel to Africa and, and enjoy looking at uh, like magnificent animals and to be able to understand what their lives are like. Yeah. To travel, I, if, I don't know if you've been on Apple and some of their interactive books, but they really have these incredible books that have experiences, they've got videos, they've got the ability to be able to open them up and, and look at uh, pictures and, and basically the scenes come to life. So let's talk about the Sahara. What does it look like? It opens up and there's a video of the Sahara. Now imagine being able as a child to be able to be immersed in that particular scene. How much better is that learning experience? You know, places you may never see to walk around the Leaning Tower of Pisa, um, to be able to walk anywhere in the world in Moscow, to be able to look at uh, pyramids and Giza. So that's what's happening. It's really changing the, the dimension. It's going from a one dimensional to three dimensional world for education. And I'm really encouraged by it. I think it's incredible, actually. It also gives us the opportunity to be able to, to change not only the way people learn, the amount that they people learn and how fast they can learn and adjust it. So we're excited about it. We're excited about the opportunities. Absolutely. AR, VR, obviously another level of uh, technologies that we are talking about when we, in India still people, I mean, move from 
offline to WhatsApp educate uh, like uh, education in terms of giving exams on WhatsApp. That's quite incredible for me to know that <laughs> WhatsApp being used as a medium of education. Uh, yes, uh, fantastic. Um, uh, we have a few more minutes left. I just quickly want to ask Sataj and the rest of the speakers to share some recent um, successful use cases uh, in terms of investments that you've done. I'd like to start with Sataj first. Um, yes, I, I think one, one part that I, I found extremely interesting is uh, um, what's happening in the corporate learning space. And that's, that's something that we haven't touched base in because that's a very big chunk of um, the education. We've talked about, you know, K-12, we've talked about higher education, we've talked about rural to urban education, but actually there's a lot happening in terms of education as, as a part of a reskilling process within uh, corporate settings. And uh, what I've seen, for example, I have been an angel investor in a company um, um, that completely um, was uh, tried to bring in elements of technology and elements of human touch together using um, the power of technology. So technology enables you to actually um, create learning pieces much faster. It enables you to customize learning. It enables you to um, actually, uh, you know, from any place uh, within your work environment or your home, you can have access to any type of skill that you want to develop. So technology enables that. But what, what, what happens is that what's the missing link is that if technology is not supported by a a very um, thorough mentoring process, it doesn't get interiorized. And so basically they brought in elements of um, human mentoring, and, but, but, but again, technology is utilized there whereby you match people for the skills that they lack with people who have those skills so that they can actually learn from each other. So my, my challenge and what that's just something that I said, you know, I think technology opens a lot of doors and it, it accelerates the process. But if technology is used just to enhance technology, uh, learning may not happen. Experience is part of it. Sharing is another part of it. Um, you have to find ways of using AI and and virtual reality so that the people actually learn from each other, um, from peers in work environment, from uh, people who have better skills than you do as a mentoring opportunity. How do you bring that together? And how do you capture that learning is, is the biggest challenge. And this is one of the places that I have over the years worked in. And I think um, blending the human and the technology is going to be the next frontier. And again, we're going to use technology to do that. Yeah, great, great point there, uh, Sataj. I really agree that the skill set gap, um, uh, you know, it's very, how to put it? I mean, you know, everybody is not at the same skill set, even though in a, in a team working on a, uh, you know, in the same team, as you rightly said. So if technology and human interaction can bring uh, you know, shorten that skill set gap is, is an amazing thing in terms of corporate learning and education. I uh, really like that point, um, Satas. Thank you so much. And next, I have Chandra Sekhar to take the same question. Awesome. Yeah. So I'll quickly, uh, you know, uh, give examples of a couple of investments I've done. And it's very interesting, you know, what uh, Sartar said, and then you also did it too. So this is a business, you know, which is uh, an AI video bot assisted platform. So we're discussing about bots and the human. So there is technology and human intervention. But what's happened here is that this is a business where the candidates, the students, they can prepare for interviews. And more importantly, you know, they can get the right jobs or the, or the or sort, sort of right placements they want in the institution they're looking for. And there is also a referral based you know, sort of employment that can happen. Now, why I love this you know, startup is because employability is a huge issue in the country. And uh, we speak about education, but look at the employability, you know, that, that is there in this country. It's a huge issue. So this app, it is basically assisting, you know, with video bot libraries, where you've got mentors are experts. So these mentors are experts, you know, they give snippets and they record it. 
And these mentors and experts, they are from organizations like MasterCard, Google, JP Morgan, KPMG, Reliance, Wipro, l &T, the best of you know, the world, Procter & Gamble. So what happens here is that those snippets, you know, again with AI, as it becomes intelligent, the bot becomes intelligent, and you know the the uh, the sort of aspirants, you know, they get the right sort of answers, and that helps them, you know, either placed in the organization that they want of their choice, or even you know when they're thinking of a higher education, the right sort of institution. The second one is even more interesting, and this is something I love. So here is a business which is basically assisting the parents, and what they do is they're inculcating the concept of money management in kids. So let me just explain that. So which means they're discussing about savings as a habit. Yeah. They're bringing a social responsibility to the kids, saying that if you do certain chores, if you do certain activities, here is a way by which you can earn. Yeah. And more importantly, they're making it gamified, interactive, so that it's extremely you know, interesting for children. Right. But now comes the best part. When I speak about money, it is actually not physical money. It's a virtual currency, which means I, as a parent, based on my sort of status, I can decide what that one coin stands for. Could be a low as a 10 rupee or could be as high as a, even a 500 rupee. But that's something that I decide, which means the money as a, you know, money as a measure is not the important thing. It's about, you know, how well you're able to train the children to truly understand, you know, that there is a responsibility that they need to inculcate. More importantly, you know, children, if they, at an early age, if they're able to understand the concept of money, if you catch them young, I think there are a lot more ways by which, you know, they could become better citizens. They could become, you know, better in terms of, you know, how they look at money. It's not something, you know, that you just need to earn for, you know, your living, but something, you know, that, that you look, you know, in a much more bigger way. And probably if India is the third largest in terms of entrepreneurship, I think this would be an amazing thing, you know, in terms of inculcating this habit as young as possible. So this Absolutely. is the other startup which I'm super excited about, completely technology driven and an ed tech you know, opportunity. And to just to add to Harsh's point, there's also FinTech here because we're talking about money. Great, Chandrasekhar, uh, great insights. I wish I had, in schools when I was growing up, I had a subject on money management. Same here. <laughs> really, you know, we never had one, but we understand the importance of uh, inculcating, as you said, the that you, yeah. at the primary stage when you are, I mean, starting from coins, investments you know little investments that you can that change your life as a child i mean very great points i, I love to know more about this startup from you actually sure. great thank you. thank you so much uh, next i have hush hush over to you please with the same question uh, great uh, <clears throat> so since the pandemic hit, hit us since i think uh, probably march or april uh, the concentration of startups coming uh, to us at aha you know they have been primarily from, uh, you know, more than adding the education space, but not just education per se. It's also training or uh, harping your skills. That kind of platform was number one. Second, obviously, was, uh, you know, health tech, pharmaceuticals also was a big, big space which uh, came to us. And third was obviously enable. So AI, uh, ML was also huge. Uh, automatically, what happened in, in during pandemic, the benchmark of evaluation suddenly changed. So we looked at, you know, about uh, 1 million active users on, on a monthly basis, which was very good uh, pre-COVID, turned out to be average post-COVID because, you know, everyone was doing great numbers. Uh, that's why you had to put extra efforts to evaluate in terms of how the business plan is going to grow, which uh, was a big issue because we did not have, the earlier benchmark we had was one investment we exited in 2018 uh, was a startup called Testbook. So, you know, we had that edtech benchmark with us uh, we had we were doing one excellent uh, uh, you know case study was again something about chandrasekhar mentioned was into uh, so the training uh, the, the whole platform works on uh, improving your skills so that you can get a perfect job so it is aligned to the job description from let's say a banking sector and they will give you diploma certifications against that so the idea is you have to be employable ready and the companies will directly hire you the platform wow. was very interesting because, uh, so let's say if I've done my graduation and I'm, I'm looking for a bank job in a very reputed, let's say an MNC bank, instead of going through a normal process and telling the, the interviewer can telling me that I'm lacking in these skills, if I'm, I'm told about that in advance and I train myself, I'm saving companies time as well as me as an right. individual, I'm getting better skills. 
So we thought that was great space. Uh, so you, 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 about a year back, we did one round about 1.5 million, and then we are doing one more round very recently. So that that transition has been good. So in fact, looking for new startups was uh, as challenging, but earlier existing uh, startups which we had on the platform, they got multiple rounds, which was very interesting. Personally, uh, uh, you know, when I'm opening my own portfolio, uh, I would want to work on social impact based education. That's why I'm, I'm evaluating one startup currently. Now that startup comes with the virtue of free education for all. So they have got about seven and a half million users on a daily basis, where they get everything free. Uh, they have been doing this for the past six years. Now they want to reach a level where they want to have learners also on board. Earlier it was only information based where you and me could go and download and access information and have a portfolio of your own education. But they are trying to bridge uh, you know, the gap by getting uh, educators also on board. So I'm working with them currently. Uh, have, you know, we've we've got a couple of interests, but this is some space which I think is going to be very very lucrative in the coming years, where education as an impact fund would be very interesting. I totally agree. Education as an impact fund. I mean, as much as it's going to be free, but again, it's uh, like creating an impact is one thing. Also, you know, for startups, it, it becomes very essential to be making revenues. You know, because Absolutely. they they are earning cash. It's very important. That's, that's a, like a catch twenty two situation, but but yes, that's uh, that's about it. Uh, thank you, Hush, for sharing those insights as well. Uh, I mean, AI is doing uh, wonders in the space of education, and education itself is doing wonders in in twenty twenty. I can see so many innovative uh, products emerged because of the pandemic. You know, WhatsApp being used as a means of education that's never heard of pre COVID actually. Gary, over to you. Yeah, so can you yeah, say the question one more time? Sorry about that. I had a... Uh, yeah, in the, the recent investments and successful use cases that you can share with our uh, audience today. Yeah, I mean, the situation. So w again, we're, we're in artificial intelligence and we're looking at how we can develop technology like AR and VR that can be adapted to the educational experience. So we look at the technology to be used in multiple vertical markets, whether it's med tech, whether it's edge tech, where, wherever it is, manufacturing, et cetera. So where we're particularly interested is um, AR and VR. And of course, um, the testing part of it, I do, uh, I have a company called Eva.ai, which does remote workforce management. And we founded it, I guess, five years ago now. It seems like forever, but <laughs> it's hard to believe. Um, but using those same technologies and to be able to adapt them for the classroom. So that's where it's really interesting for me. And I'm really interested in, I wrote an article called Nikola Tesla's Dream Comes True, the democratization of opportunities. And I believe this has given us that. And from my standpoint, any types of uh, technologies that can be used to be able to enhance the experience, a hyper-personalized experience are investments that, um, that we make or we're involved in. So it's not just ed tech, it goes across the board, right? Yeah. It's that, so, um, and I wrote an article, an, another article called Transportable AI Models. It's the same kind of thing. So we're investing across the board. Some of them are applicable to edutech. Uh, some of them aren't. Some are AR, VR, um, of course, artificial intelligence, optimization to be able to tailor learning experience for the kids, a, a really interesting from my standpoint, but it's not just the kids, right? It's across the board. Everybody's got the problem, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. uh, university students have the problem. How can I, if I'm studying to be a doctor, how can I have those kind of in hospital experiences um, as a doctor? I have one company called now um, Skill Cup, and Skill Cup is a company that goes down through and understands how do I train. If I'm, again, a part of education, how can I go down and train people to be able to um, keep their skills sharp when they're remote, remote employees? How do I engage them in the experience? How can I gamify it? How can I enhance that learning experience and make them feel part of the team? So, uh, yeah, it's, so Skill Cup's one of them, but again, ours is really general across the board where they can be applied in a whole lot of different ways. Absolutely. Great, great uh, insights, Gary. As a, again, if we're focusing on refocusing on corporate education and skill set.
Thank you so much for sharing uh, all your insights today. Uh, I mean, I really love the panel considering we have new speakers and very new insights coming from a country like India, um, Singapore, US, and globally, generally globally speaking. Um, so that's very enriching for me and I'm sure for our audience as well. Let's take closing remarks considering the time. I'll start with Chandrasekhar first. So they say, you know, Sunny, that if you torture data long enough, it'll confess to anything. So that's <laughs> true about the tech also in India. If you take the education market size, it's almost $120 billion. But the take is hardly, you know, inching towards $2.8 billion. So which means we're, you know, discussing less than 3% of the education market itself. So I think it's a long way to go when we speak about EdTech in this country. Yes, it has done, uh, you know, some greater, uh, uh, you know, benefits, you know, uh, given in the, in the current situation. But I think it's a long way to go. If you ask me personally, you know, you know where I would, uh, you know, want to see a change in the EdTech, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, segment that we are in. I think one of the mindset that has to change, you know, for uh, students, students across ages, because as, uh, you know, Carrie rightly said, I think yeah. all of us, you know, have to keep learning, right? It's, it's a continuous yeah. education. So mm -hmm. one of the mindset that has to change is that education does not end with a graduation or a post-graduation, let's say even a professional qualification. Yeah. I think we have to think, you know, it's, it's a lifelong journey. Absolutely. So how do, you know, some of these education companies, ed tech companies, you know, they are evolving to ensure that that sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a continued, you know, sort of benefit is given, you know, that is, I think is very, very relevant. And I think the second is, uh, I wish, you know, it's not uh, grade driven and more of a goal driven. Now, I know that this country has brought something called the national education policy, and I hope yes. it's not grade driven and goal driven, but, you know, it has to still, you know, act and pave out, you know, the way it is. And I think to me, you know, the biggest challenge is not about the smartphone, which even Hirsch said, you know, because I think we have 600 million, you know, smartphones across in a population, which is like 1.3 billion. But I think the bandwidth, I think that's a huge issue in this country. So when we speak about technology, I think the bandwidth, you know, has to you know, really improve. And finally, if I have to add something, uh, some of the placement and skilling institutes, they always take pride saying that not we have done the placement, we have done all this. But yeah. I guess somewhere, you know, yeah. they also, you know, sort of uh, come across and say, I think we got you to think differently. And because you yeah. thought differently, you know, you are in a position where you are. And I think that if that happens, I think that would be great for education. That would be great for it. That would be Absolutely. Very good, very good points. But I think education, great driven and goal driven is a long way to happen. I think, I think it's a long way to go. And it's not only in India. It's not only in India. It's Probably. actually yes. everywhere. Um, but again, you are very rightly um, pointed out there. And we all, we always think about that, right? But uh, who knows when, when is that going to happen? Let me also thank you. A great way to moderate, Sunny. I mean, I, I just love this platform. Very unique experience for me because it's my first time. But more important, I think you're trying to bring, you know, people from various parts of the world together. I mean, I just loved, you know, the perspectives which each shared. And I think there is a capability that you're helping us to exchange our thoughts. I think that's truly brilliant. It's a great platform. Thank you. Thank you, Chandrasekhar, for those remarks uh, and feedback about VCTV. That's what we love to hear. I mean, that's where we get, a, uh, you know, improve ourselves. Thank you so much. Uh, Satnaj, over to you uh, with your closing oh. remarks and VCTV. Yes. I, I, yes, we are definitely on the um, sort of onset of a big, big revolution in the way people learn, uh, but also in the way people behave and in the way people actually consume. Um, it's part and parcel of a big uh, shift in, uh, you know, interacting with technology and, and perfecting it further. But, but I always bring it to the equity part of it, you know, equitable, you know, how much of how, how, how many people have access to it and how, yeah. how, how, how is that access is guaranteed and, and over time, well, you know, what factors to really get um, a say in who gets what, who benefits from what. Uh, I mean, there is a democratization process through technology, but at the same time, we've seen that democratization is still at the expense of some people who benefit from it more and others uh, much less. And, and especially with the pandemic, what we're saying is, is that there are going to be about 400 million people in Asia which are going to fall below the poverty line. Uh, because they don't have access to work. They don't have access yeah. to basic needs. Uh, you're not going to solve that with technology easily. You know, you have to have public policy. You have to have, uh, you know, uh, redistribution of wealth. 
Um, how is that going to be addressed? So, you know, uh, yes, education is, is definitely uh, going to benefit um, in the first run from this big impetus towards um, technology, but then what's going to determine the efficacy of it then is, is who's going to access to it and who's going to have the means to actually benefit from it. And that's, I think, something that we should not forget. Oh, very much uh, agree with you. It's the government. <laughs> What's your feedback about the VCTV? Uh, Sataj, what's what do you think? Uh, what's your feedback about VCTV, the format? Oh no, I have absolutely. But thank you very much. I'm really happy to have you know people that I would never maybe cross roads because they live in different parts of the world. But I, Harsh and 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 Gary and. Chandra Sheik, I think it's a great opportunity and I'm going to come and bug you guys on, on <laughs> the education sector. Like so so <laughs> the VCTV gives me this possibility to actually reach out to you and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, great words of bug you guys. <laughs> Thank you so mm. much, Sataj. Ash, uh, what's your closing remarks and feedback about VCTV? Uh, I, I would like to, you know, uh, take Gary's word ahead of you know, how it runs across the board. Uh, anyone who comes, uh, you know, decides to get into ed tech today, I think uh, disruptive innovation needs to be, I think, highly focused on. Uh, you know, while we have different matrices at looking at how a startup is doing, uh, but how easily it is approachable, uh, how easily it is ex executable. At the same time, uh, the cost factor, you know, not everyone's going to afford a laptop and a Zoom login, right? It's, it's, it's the way it's going to be. Uh, but, uh, you know, all those, uh, um, you know, aspiring entrepreneurs trying to start their own edtech, you know, I would like to tell them, don't just look at one crowded space of schools, uh, look beyond that, uh, look across all the education patterns we have, which is going to create value in the long run, you know, uh, the biggest problem which I think can be explored more is, like other uh, business and sectors we have, education has not, not yet become asset like you know there's a lot of dependencies on content on tutors if you try to make that uh, solution quite handy i think it's it, it is a long way to go as it is we have you know we have seen that industry is going quite well i mean thanks to zoom uh, you know we are we are here today uh, yeah on a different platform it would have been almost impossible for me to be here or meet everyone uh, but yeah i think disruptive innovation is something which i think is is, is going to happen or is, something which the entrepreneurs need to focus well on. Uh, coming to VCTV, I'm, I'm so glad I, I accepted that invitation. Uh, to be very honest, I could not really uh, go through too many episodes in the past, but I was pleasantly surprised uh, now that I have a fantastic three to four more colleagues to add to my list. Uh, more than happy to be here and always be in touch. Thank you so much for this. Ah, great, uh, great hash. Good to hear that, those uh, closing remarks and feedback about VCTV. And we're going to have you back on the panels and, and we speak as some of them are going to bug you as well. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, over to you with your, please, your best moments of VCTV. Best moments? Every morning I get to see you, Sonny. You know what I mean? It's like the sunshine. Right. I don't know what to say. It's great. <laughs> no, there's a lot of great moments. I mean, I've met some incredible people. I met... Um, Richard Branson's partner here. I met some of the wealthiest people on the planet that sometimes come in cognito and come on the show. And you, you know, I follow up with a lot of them and it's incredible the kind of conversations, whether they're from Germany or Singapore or China or wherever. So it's really expanded the universe for me. I mean, we reach out to Africa now, we reach out to Indonesia, Bangladesh, all over the EU. So it's really expanded the reach. And I mean, this is what's happened in the beginning of the pandemic. Think about it. We weren't able to communicate and be able to have that sense of community. And VCTV came in at the right place at the right time to provide that camaraderie and that, you know, that good feeling that we're, we're all together working through this in a place to be able to, for me, it's like a, it's like a tech therapy session. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Because you get on and, you know, we yeah. learn about, I started writing about quantum computers because of VCTV. I, um, oh, I started diving into some other areas of artificial intelligence. 
that were quite interesting for me. So I've taken the topics. It's helped me get an overall 360 degree view of where uh, technology is going and it's helped me be able to write and, and to be able to invest and look for those kind of companies. And connect, I got now a 370 VCs that I deal with directly uh, on a regular basis. I have about 160 some that I'm talking to you know, on and off. I have many, many calls every day, but a lot of them are from VCTV and, you know, it's a lot of fun. I, what can I say? It's, it's a lot of fun and it's a great way to find incredible companies. And, Excellent. And awesome. Did you just say it's a tech ter ter therapy? Sorry. It's like tech therapy. I mean, you know, it's like, great. It's like, I come in, I feel like an addict. I come in here in the morning and it's like, I need to get my juice in the morning, you know, <laughs> it's, it's like a cup so, of coffee. I mean, it's amazing. It's, it's so good. Is it, because, exactly. Uh, talking about impact. This is VCTV's impact. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's VCTV is a great impact. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gary, for those closing remarks. Uh, really feels good because I'm a part of VCTV myself. I, I moderate these panels. Just imagine the kind of information uh, I get to uh, receive, as Gary rightly said, is uh, like, you know, I can't miss those sessions. It's so much, like I'm an addict as well. I, I have to confess on VCTV tonight. Like I can't miss this session myself. Um, so thank you so much again. We come to the end of the session, slightly overrun in time, but it's okay, no worries. So uh, I am back um, uh, Monday to Friday uh, on different topics and speakers like yourself, you want to contribute because I really enjoyed the uh, session today. If you'd like to contribute uh, more on different topics, please feel, rich, uh, feel free to reach out to me and Carol and we're always gonna place you on different panels. Again, uh, viewers, founders, entrepreneurs, uh, investors who like to share the space with other speakers and investors today, as you rightly said, these people really looking forward to have more and more. They're going to increase their network and um, uh, have people who can share the same knowledge, speak the same uh, language, you know. Uh, please feel free to do so as well. We're happy to have you on board on VCTV. Having said that, thank you again so much, very much for your time. Uh, let's all stay connected through VCTV, um, but also stay safe. And uh, have a great day. Have a great thank evening. You.